So uh, I believe uh, this is the option that you can choose by clicking at that uh, upward arrow beside the start video at the bottom. And then there is a video settings. And so go there and choose, uh, do not choose, deselect, spotlight my video when speaking. So that's one thing we want you to do. Number two, uh, it's better to choose view in speaker view. And you can choose that if you click at an icon at the top right corner. So one icon there will allow you to toggle between gallery view and the uh, uh, and the speaker view. So make sure to choose speaker view. And everybody should be muted and only the speaker um, will be given the uh, um, right to, 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 will be given the right to speak uh, when necessary. So we have five talks. Each talk will be 18 minutes. Uh, so roughly speaking 14, 15 minutes for the presentation plus three minute question. And during the presentation, there will not be uh, questions answered. Instead, please uh, type in your question in Zoom. Uh, if you click a chat, you will see the chat window and you can enter your question there. Uh, I understand some people may be using Slack and you can also type your question in Slack. Probably it's better if everybody can just do that in Zoom, uh, that will be helpful. So when the talk is, when the video is over, uh, the speaker can answer to your questions. So uh, we can start now. Uh, I can, could you please play the first uh, video? Uh, yeah. The paper is titled Being Happy with the Least, Achieving Alpha Happiness, of a happiness with minimum number of tuples. The presenter is Ming Xie from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation entitled with being happy with the list. Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation entitled with being happy with the list, achieving our happiness with minimum number of tasks. This is Jenny from Shenzhen Institute of Computer Science, SICS, and this is John work between uh, SICS, HKUSD, Inspire AI, and Museum Rubens. And this is the outline of this presentation. Let's start with innovation. So assume that we have done a common design and consists of a number of apartments for someone from Q1 to Q6. Each apartment is associated or is described by some attribute for some X1 and X2. Without loss of generality, we assume that a larger value in, some, in each uh, attribute is more preferable. For example, the X1 attribute can be the apartment size. And we have a user for Alex. She wants to buy an apartment in this apartment database. And the question is, which apartment should I buy? There can be many candidate apartments in this market, so how can we help Alex to find a apartment she is interested in? Actually, similar programs are frequently and in our daily life, such as carpentry and guitar booking. In the literature, there are many popular queries for solving these problems, such as the public query and the skylight query. In this talk, we will talk about a recent type of query, which is called the regret minimization query. In the regret minimization query, we assume that Alice has a utility function in her mind. For example, the utility function can just be a weight sum of the attribute value, and the weight sum we call the utility of the apartment. And we also assume that a larger weight means that the corresponding dimension is more important in Alice's mind. Concisely, we can represent the user preference using a utility vector, and in this case, it is two for three and two for seven. But in some cases, we might not know this is this function in the one. Suppose that the whole data set is given by user Alex 
and we could find her favorite apartment to sleep in this thing that, which is the apartment has with the maximum utility, and the utility is equal to zero point eight one in the time. However, suppose that we just have a subset of apartment P two and P four. Suppose that Alex has not seen the full data set D, but instead only X because he can be utilized for her. And we could find her favorite apartment in this small subset, which is P2. And the utility in this maximum utility in this one. And you can observe that there is difference between these two utility values. And based on this, this difference, we can compare Alex happiness ratio, which is simply the ratio between Alex maximum utility in X and Alex maximum utility in entire society. And in this case, it is compared to the 0 0.938. If Alex maximum utility in X is equal to Alex maximum utility in B, then Alex happiness ratio can be converted to 1. And this is the perfect. In other words, we would like to have a larger value for Alex happiness ratio. So this is also a why this part is called regret minimization part because we want to make the user less regret. Alright, this is for Alex, okay? But there can be many other users, for example, Mary and Peter. Based on Mary's uh, utility functions, we can compute Mary's happiness ratio, and based on Peter's utility functions, we can compute Peter's happiness ratio. They may have, they might have different utility functions in general. And we define a terminology for the minimum happiness ratio, means which is the minimum of all possible happiness ratio among all users. And in this case, if we just consider two users, the mean cap is 2.872. By saying that we can fill in all the users, we mean that we model each user's preference using a utility vector in the form of W1, W2. And the mean cap is just the worst case happiness ratio by considering all possible sets and vectors. And our goal is to make the worst case as good as possible. So here comes our formal problem definition. Uh, we are given a data set C and a happiness just called alpha. We would like to find a subset S in the data set C such that the minimum happiness ratio of S is at least alpha. And at the same time, the alpha size, the size of S is minimized. We call this query the alpha happiness query in this block, and it has been proven in the literature that it is an answer. The best known service network for alpha happiness query is called an HF. And unfortunately, when we experimentally evaluate for um, alpha, I can uh, could you pause yeah. the video for, for a moment? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I heard a lot of uh, background noise, I, and I just want to make sure whether it's uh, from, let's say, your side or from the video itself. Uh, I don't think there should be any noise. Um, okay, I'll try to go, go somewhere else. You can go there. Then. Okay, I'll restart the video. <laughs> Still, there is some noise you can tell me. We want to be happy. The existing metric is during a very long query time. This is because that its execution time is proportional to this quantity, which becomes prohibited when the user requires a large alpha. In this paper, our contribution is uh, listed as follows. We provide a geometric interpretation of the alpha happiness query, which have not been considered before, and also proposing a novel algorithm called congruity for answering the alpha happiness query. The concrete algorithm has a bonded alpha sign and it's not sensitive to the last alpha. Let's firstly go through our methodology, how we do that. Uh, we first give some uh, geometry minimum. Okay, this is our apartment database again. Actually, uh, we can visualize each apartment as a point in a 2D space. For example, in this case, we can uh, visualize each apartment as a point in the X1, X2 space. And Based on the points, we can construct the current part of this set. And in this case, the state is the black region is the current part of it. Okay. Similarly, if we just have a subset of apartments, for example, P3 and P4, we can also construct a current part based on this subset. And in this case, the black region is the current part of the selected subset X. Okay. 
then we introduce the alpha front set. Assume that we have an alpha set to zero point nine, and this is our original apartment data set. We want to do a transformation by proportionally scale each apartment in a data set by a factor of zero point nine, by a factor of r. And we have a new data set, d pi. Each apartment in it is it is a proportionally scaled apartment of the original data set. And we call this new data set as the alpha front set of the original data set. And based on the resulting data set, we can also pop our construct a convex part of all the apartments. And we here we use the blue convex part to represent the convex part of the alpha front set. Okay. Then we introduce a new problem called the spatial coverage problem. In the spatial coverage problem, we are given a data set D and a spread hole alpha. We want to find a set S of apartments such that the cover part of the alpha shrunk set of D is totally contained inside the cover part of the geometric set. And at the same time, the output size, the size of S is minimal. For example, consider the two figures. On the left hand side, we have the convex part of the geometric set S, where S is equal to T3 and T4. We have to find it previously. And also on the right hand side, we have a blue convex part, which is the convex part of the alpha concept. And the spatial time problem is going to determine whether the blue convex part is totally contained inside the black convex part. And in this case, the answer is yes. And we would like to find the minimal size such kind of set X. And this is the solution for the spatial time problem. It seems like that the spatial time problem is irrelevant to the alpha happiness query. Actually, they are equivalent. We formally prove that S is the solution of the alpha happiness query if and only if it is a solution of the spatial current problem. So based on this operation, we propose our algorithm concrete. The idea is very simple, it just contains two steps. In the first step, we define the coverage of each apartment in the data set. And secondly, we we'll use the greedy strategy to add apartments greedily based on their coverage. Okay, let's start with the first part, coverage. We define the coverage based on the visibility of each apartment. For example, in this figure, the blue color part is the color part of our sunset. And we have an apartment, for example, P3 in this example. And based on their position, we can define the maximum visible range from P3 to the color part of the alpha sunset. And based on the visible range, we can compute two extreme vectors. In this case, there are two, but in higher dimension, there can be more, okay? Uh, but we have two here, just, just two here, okay? Well, each of, each of the extreme vector is perpendicular to a boundary of the maximum visible range from P3 to the common part, okay? And recall that we uh, assume that if user's preference is represented in the form of a utility vector W1 and W2. So W1, W2 form the utility space. And we can plot the utility space where the x coordinate is w1 and y coordinate is w2. And the two extreme vectors, v1 and v2, will form a boundary region in the utility space, like this. And we formally prove that if uh, apartment P3 is in the selected set and analyst utility vector is in this region, then analyst happiness ratio will be at least R. And the volume, in this case, the volume of this state region can be regarded as the coverage of P3. Then we come to the second step. We just define the coverage, and we want to uh, con construct solutions based on their coverage, okay? For example, this is the coverage of P3, and using a similar strategy, we have a coverage of some other forms, other apartments, uh, like P4. And our strategy is to construct the solution to add by adding apartments greedily until the entire utility space is covered. We formally prove that by constructing the solution set in this way, if the coverage of the apartments in S covers the entire utility space, the color part of the alpha sum set is totally contained inside the color part of the selected set. And then it is a valid solution for the alpha happiness query. And further to uh, to improve the computational efficiency, we also approximate the current of each apartment using steps to speed up the computation. This is the idea. And 
communication to our theoretical result, the performance guarantee. Uh, okay, uh, our conjugate algorithm will return a set F of comments such that F will have an output, uh, a log cycle bond on the upper side. Here, it involves many parameters, but I don't want to overwhelm the deal with many, with many technical details. So just highlight the key feature here. So in other words, the concrete algorithm will get alpha guarantee and the happiness guarantee at the same time. Okay, this is our methodology. Uh, let's uh, briefly talk about our experiment. We conduct experiments on different real data sets and compare our concrete algorithm with some existing methods by varying the Different value of minimum happiness ratio and measuring the exclusion time and output time. This is uh, one example result on the airline data set, which I mentioned data with 5 million of airlines. And uh, on the left, the picture, we show the output size of all the algorithms. And concretely, it's our algorithm. And it can be seen that our algorithm returns a set with the smallest output size in all states. On the right hand side, we uh, show the exclusion time. And we show that the exclusion time of concurrency is the smallest, and at the same time, it is not sensitive to the value of R. However, uh, com in comparison, compared with the method competitors, their performance degrades rapidly when R becomes less. And our algorithm is much faster for life R. Okay, this comes to our conclusion of this presentation. In this talk, we uh, talk about the alpha happiness query, and by interpreting it from a normal geometric perspective, we propose a spatial component and so there it could. And moreover, we give an efficient solution for phone greedy, uh, which is not sensitive to the value of last alpha, and we also have no theoretical guarantee. And also, the empirical performance of the phone greedy algorithm is good. Okay, this is the end of this presentation. Any questions? I don't think uh, we collected any questions. Um, let me just check. Yeah, there's no question in Zoom and I don't see any question in Slack either. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on to the next talk. So the second paper is titled Improving Neural Relation Extraction with Implicit Mutual Relations. And this will be presented by Jun Kwan from East China Normal University. Jun Kwan is currently a master's student in the School of Data Science and Engineering at East China Normal, uh, Normal University. Uh, his research interests include knowledge engineering and uh, natural language processing. So I'm going to start the video now. Hello everyone. My name is Jun Kwan from Eastern China Normal University. The work I present today is called Improving Neural Relation Extraction with Implicit Mutual Relations. So now let's see our background and continuation of this work. Relation extraction aims to automatically extract the relation between two keys from the plaintiff. For example, given this sentence, the goal is to identify the relation boundary between Microsoft and Bill Gates. The effective way is to train a relation class file by using the level of that. But as we all know, the human level is extremely expensive, so the distance correlation can move into the spotlight. The assumption of the distance correlation is that if two entities participate in a relation, 
any sentence that contains those parentheses might express that relation. So, based on the assumption, the training bit can be admittedly limited by aligning the existing knowledge graph to an unstructured text. This consideration addressed the issue of the high level cost of the labeling bit. However, it may introduce some art problems. The first problem is the insufficient training of any pairs. Here to widely use the system distortion data sites, NYT and GBS, as an example. In the two data sites, the number of training sentences for mo most any pairs are less than five. That is, the number of training sentences for any pairs. So, long term distribution. As such, most any pairs can be insufficiently trained, which can reduce the performance of distance exploration approaches. The second problem is the long labeling problem. The assumption of distance exploration is too strong. In fact, not all the sentences which contain the entity pair can accurately express the relation. For example, from the third sentence in this table, we cannot infer that the non champ is the president of the United States. So there is a lot of noise in the distance exploration on the side. The long level of sentences exacerbate the inadequate issue of training debt. To address these problems, we propose to transfer the relational knowledge from rich source entity pairs to infrequent entity pairs. As you see in this table, for the target and repair, Stanford University, California, the relation is not easily predicted due to the insufficient training synthesis and not dead. Meanwhile, the other entity pairs have relatively more supporting synthesis, and obviously, these entity pairs are helpful for the relation classification of any pair, Stanford University, California. Since they are similar in semantical and sharing the common relation, to capture the similarity between entity pairs, we demand the implicit mutual relations to let the relational knowledge can be transferred between different entity pairs. Now let's move to technical detail of our method. As illustrated in the figure, this framework can be divided into three parts. The first part is to model the implicit mutual relations. The second part is to learn the entity type project. And the third part is to extract the relation knowledge from training synthesis. Finally, we integrate these three parts to make a final decision. To model the implicit mutual relations, firstly, we construct an entity proximity graph where the entity proximity can be defined as the co-occurrence of similarity between entities in an external unlabeled coupler rather than the training coupler. We can learn the implicit mutual relations between entity pairs after embedding all entities into low dimensional deep space while capturing the topological structure of vertices in the entity proximity graph. We construct the entity proximity graph based on the external and unlabeled coupler. The weight of each edge is the normalized co-occurrence co times of the corresponding entity pair in the unlabeled copper. The entity proximity graph can preserve the semantical similarity between entities. Since the entities with similar semantical have, sem has, have similar topological, the shown figure, Poston and Dallas, which entities with the sem semantical are similar in the topological structure in the graph since they have directly linked and share many common labels. So we can learn the entity embeddings from the entity proximity graph by network embedding approach. This first minimizes the object function O1 to learn the first order proximity, where PEIEJ is the joint probability of the entity pair EIEJ. It is a sigmoid function of the inner product between these two entities embedding. By minimizing O1, the first order proximity between entities will be preserved. And we minimize the object function O2 
Then the second order proximity, where the PEJ given EI is the probability of context EJ generated by the text EI. Reserving both the first order proximity and the second order proximity separately, we obtain the embedding vector for vertex by concatenating corresponding embedding vectors and from these two objective functions. The entity embedding preserved the semantic similarity between entities. Thus, the implicit mutual relation is defined as the offset of the entities, that is, MRIJ. The relation between entity pair is constrained by any type. So we embedded each any type to a dimension, low dimensional space to run the constraint. And to extract the information from training synthesis, we use the PCN to encode the same spike for each entity pair, and then mm -hmm. utilize a synthesis level attention mm -hmm. to abandon the wrong level of depth. The attention mm -hmm. mechanism sends a weight for each sentence in the sentence mm -hmm. spike. The weight alpha is calculated by the softmax function of Q. And Q is a query based function which scores how well the synthesis and the predicted relation matches. Finally, we integrate the any types and the implicit mutual relations into PCN. The entity pairs with similar implicit mutual relation possibly have the same relation. Therefore, we can infer a computer score of each relation for the target any pair while using the implicit mutual relation. Likewise, the entity type and the original relation extraction model can also give the confidence score. To achieve a more accurate result, we combine these three part scores, as is shown in the formula PIJ. So now, let's move to the empirical study. Through the empirical study, we aim at addressing three research questions. The first one is how our method performs comparing with the state-of-the-art approaches. The second one is the flexibility of our method. And the last one is whether the implicit mutual relations are helpful. We conduct the experiments on two widely used sites, NYT and GDS. The statistics of these two data sites are shown in the table. To verify the effectiveness of our model, we compile our PATMR model with some state-of-the-art baselines. Shown in the figure, our PATMR model outperforms all of the baselines significantly. As shown in the table, PAT and the PAMR are the variants of our proposed model, which only adopt the entity type and the implicit mutual relations to improve the relation rejection model. The experimental results show that both PAT and PAMR outperform the basic relation rejection model PCN ATT. This points to the positive effect of integrating both the implicit mutual relations and any types into the relation rejection model. To illustrate the flexibility of our PATMR method, we incorporate the components of implicit mutual relations and any types into the other linear relation rejection approaches. As illustrated in the figure, the basic CNN based and RN based models can achieve significant improvement while integrating our implicit mutual relations into them. It indicates that the implicit mutual relations can be integrated into most of new neural network relation injection methods easily. And we evaluate the performance of our PATMR model with different co-occurrence frequencies in unlabeled copper. As illustrated in the figure, no matter frequent or infrequent co-occurrences of any pairs in the unlabeled copper, 
our PATMR outperforms the original model PACNATT. This points to the positive effect of all implicit materializations collected from the unlabeled copula. And to demonstrate the effectiveness of implicit materializations for infrequent entity pairs, we evaluate the performance of PATMR on the entity pairs with adequate training synthesis. As shown in this figure, our PATMR model can significantly improve the performance of any pairs with inadequate training synthesis. We conduct a case study to demonstrate the meanings of the implicit mutilation after entity embedding. As illustrated in this table, most entity pairs with clouds implicit mutilations to Stanford University, California share the same relation located in. It indicates that the implicit mutilations is reasonable to capture the symmetrical of the entity pairs. Thus can be rewarding to predict the relation for target entity pair. So now I give you the conclusions. Firstly, we propose to utilize the improved implicit relations between entity pairs to improve the relation regression task. And we mine such mutual relations from the easily available unlabeled data. Secondly, we design a unified and flexible deep neural network framework, which ensembles the training corpora, new types, and uh, implicit mutual relations. It proposes to eject a relation from the parentics. Finally, we evaluate the proposed algorithm against the baselines on two data sites. Experimental results illustrate that uh, the promising performance and uh, indicate that the implicit mutualizations are rewarding to improve the performance of both CNN-based and R-based regression regression models. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, for this paper, I didn't see any questions either. Um, oh, there's one question. Okay. Um, from from Chengming Wu, uh, the question is, I have a, uh, the entity proximity graph. Okay, let me try to read it. Okay, the question is, um, it's about the first component in the framework, which is the entity proximity graph. The entity pairs uh, similarity seems to have the same effect on word embedding or have the same effect as word embedding. Uh, so in your work, uh, you conducted a sentence embedding. Did you use any word embeddings to represent uh, to represent the sentences. Um, and also you combine the three components. Did you analyze which component makes the most contribution? I hope the question mm -hmm. is clear. Um, okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, the first question, uh, uh, yes. Uh, the first, the first, the first comment, the first comment is similar to the what, what worked, but uh, what worked uh, cannot capture the similar similar between the entity pairs, and uh, we don't use any uh, we don't use the what embedding in the this uh, in this component. Uh, what we do is to uh, construct an entity proximity graph and then use the. Uh, uh, a uh, network embedding approach to embed to embed each 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 entities and then to represent the implicit materializations. And uh, for the second question, and we we conduct uh, an experiment to illustrate that the uh, any type and uh, implicit materializations are both are both be positive effect to the relation regression works. So, uh, 
Oh, are you done? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Looks like uh, there's no more question and let's move on to the next paper. <clears throat> the next paper is song, approximate nearest neighbor search on GPU. And it will be presented by Wei Jie Zhao from Baidu Research. Uh, Wei Jie is a researcher at Baidu working on massive scale machine learning system and uh, fast, fast and nearest neighbor search algorithms. Hi, Kanch, could you please uh, play the video? Yeah, I'll start the video. Excuse me, that's not my video. I'm sorry, but this is not the video. This is my video. Star, I believe. Um, the presenter is. Uh, the, uh, just a second. The presenter is uh, Lou. Uh, no, it should be. Uh, uh, Wei Jie, yeah, this one. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. This is Wei Jie Zhao from Baidu Research. In this talk, I will introduce some and approximate nearest neighbor search system on GPU. This is a joint work with Shu Longtan and Ping Li. Nearest neighbor search is a fundamental problem in machine learning, data mining, and many applications. For example, given a handwritten digits data set and a query figure, we would like to find the most similar figure in the data set. It can be used in clustering and information retrieval. For sparse vectors, inverted index may work well to find the exact solution. However, for high dimensional dense vectors, it can be very difficult to locate the exact most similar results. Therefore, some approximate nearest neighbor search solution emerge. Here, we list four major research diversions for the approximate nearest neighbor search. They are locality sensitive hashing, quantization, tree based method, and graph based method. Recently, Graph-based methods show superior performance to other solutions in many data sets. The graph-based method builds a proximity graph index. In the proximity graph, the vertices represent data points in the data sets, and the edges represent the neighborhood relationship between connected vertices. It can be similar to the KNN graph. Various constraints for edges are proposed in recent literatures. However, most of the graph-based methods share the same searching algorithm, and this searching algorithm is the goal we are going to optimize in this paper. Let's first read the algorithm. The workflow is very similar to the A-star search. In every iteration, we get a vertex from the priority queue, Q, and search its unvisited neighbors. The priority queue is ordered ascendingly by their distance to the query point. Top K is another priority queue that stores the results. It orders the vertices descendingly according to their distance to the query point. It goes through like this, and it's very similar to the breadth-first search. Here, let's go through an example. Suppose the query point is the red star. We want to find its top three neighbors. We begin our search from vertex one. That is, we initialize the queue as one, mark one as positive. In the first situation, 
we put all the neighbors of one into the priority queue, they are ordered based their distance to the query point. In the second iteration, we are at vertex two. Uh, vertex three and eight are pushed into the queue and the is hash table. In the third iteration, we are at node eight. Vertex 13 and 14 are inserted into the queue. In the fourth iteration, six mm. is pushed into the queue. Mm. We can observe that now the first element in Q is worse than the first element in top K. That means the best element in Q is worse than the worst element in top K. It triggers the stop criterion of the searching algorithm and we found our top three neighbors. A good ANN solution must be good to parallel. For the graph-based methods, a possible solution may be in a query parallelism. However, by this example, we can observe that there is a high execution dependency in the search algorithm. It runs iteratively. Current graph-based ANN toolboxes generally imply inter-query parallelism. In the multi-query scenario, graph-based methods are the fastest AN algorithm comparing with other methods at the same accuracy level on CPU platforms. However, nowadays, GPUs are so, so powerful and much, much faster than CPU servers. For example, FIRS uses product quantization and FIRS becomes the fastest solution on GPU platforms. I assume we all believe that the parallelism really matters. In case some audience are not familiar with GPU, let me just briefly introduce the GPU architecture. The GPU has dozens of streaming multiprocessors. Each streaming multiprocessor can have dozens of cores. The total number of cores in a GPU can become several thousand. All streaming multiprocessors share an L2 cache and a global memory. Although the global memory becomes larger and larger these days, most GPUs only have dozens of gigabytes global memory. The global memory in GPU are very limited. The streaming multiprocessor employs single instruction multiple data parallelism by grouping consecutive threads of a block into a warp. All the threads in a warp have to perform the same instruction at a time. With this background knowledge, we can start to introduce our system SOM. It is the acronym of search on graph. There are mainly three stages in SOM. The first stage is candidate locating. We need to read the graph index to find the candidate's vertices to compute distances. The second stage is to actually compute the distances in a batch, because in ANN context, we commonly have high dimensional vectors. This stage can be computational intensive. The third stage is to maintain the data structures, such as hash table visited and two priority queues, Q and top K. We have three major data structures in the graph search algorithm. First, top K is a priority queue that keeps the results. Secondly, Q is another priority queue that stores the search frontiers. And visited is a hash table that marks whether a vertex is visited. Since we only want to find the top K results, the capacity of top K is a constant K. The frontier Q can also grow to a number of searching steps. We can also bound the capacity of the frontier Q to K by employing a min max P and only keep its best K frontiers. The visited hash table is a tough problem. 
if we really insert all the visited vertices into the hash table, asymptotically, the capacity of the hash table can be the number of certain steps. It may yield dynamic GPU memory allocation, which is expensive. We introduced two optimizations called selective insertion and visited deletion to trade computation for memory. We do not mark a vertex as visited when it is worse than all the current bounds of k results. And when a vertex is popped from the top k priority queue, we delete it from the visited hash table. Essentially, the hash table holds and only holds the vertices that are currently in the two priority queues. Mm, thus, the capacity of the hash table is now bounded to 2K. The side effects of these optimizations are that we may compute the distances of some vertices multiple times. These multiple computed vertices will not be in the top k results will not be inserted into the frontier search and also will not be expanded in the search since they are not good enough. And we can find this out immediately after we compute their distance. Since we have massive number of cores in GPU, the computational overhead is minimal. Here, we only show two optimizations due to the top time limit. More optimization details, such as filter and cuckoo filters, uh, several techniques, we further improve the memory. And these things can be found in the paper. Let's directly go to the experiment. We use six public data sets. The dimension varies from 128 to 960, and the number of data varies from around 29,000 to 8 million. In this figure, we compare some with single threads HNSW and GPU fares. The x-axis is recall, and the y-axis is queries per second, and it's logarithmic, the higher, the better. Comparing with the GPU massive fares, we have consistently better performance. Moreover, since fares employs quantization, it is hard to reach the high recall ranges for fares. Comparing with the CPU HNSW, we can observe a 50 to 180 times speed up. We also consider a case when the data set is out of the GPU memory. Since we have high dimensional data, the data set is usually much larger than the graph index. The MNIST HM data set has 784 dimensions. It is larger than the GPU memory of Titan X. We use one bit random projection to hash the data and reduce the size. In the last figure, we sample 1 million vectors. In this case, it fits in the GPU memory. We can see that with 256 bits hashing, we can even improve the performance of some over the original data because the hashed codes are shorter than the original vector and the distance computation can be faster. Using some on the hashed data can be an orthogonal research access. The right figure shows the case when we have 8 million vectors. 128 bits hashing can result good performance. The hashing can significantly reduce the data size to fit the GPU memory. In our previous experiments, we used 10,000 queries. The batch size really matters when we are able to have larger batches, such as 100,000 queries, we can see that the performance can be further improved. Finally, let's conclude this talk. In this paper, 
we introduce an ANN system SOM. To the best of our knowledge, SOM is the first GPU graph-based ANN system. We develop a novel framework that decouples the searching on graph algorithm into three stages, candidates locating, bulk distance computation, and data structures maintenance to parallel the performance crucial distance computation. We propose a combination of data structures and optimizations for GPU and graph searching to efficiently utilize GPU memory and trade computations for less memory consumption. We evaluate experimentally the proposed system and compare it against HNSW and FIRS on six datasets. The results confirm that SOM has around 50 to 180 times speed up compared with single thread HNSW, while it substantially outperforms GPU version fields. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, if uh, anyone has a question to the speaker, you can type in the chat window. Um, since I don't see any question at this moment, maybe uh, maybe let me just ask one question. Um, so if I understand correctly, um, the graph search is based on the assumption of uh, um, uh, transitivity, uh, basically, right? So the distance from A to C is greater than the distance from A to B and plus the distance from B to C. That, that's the assumption on the similarity function uh, you are using, I suppose. Uh, although uh, there was some proof on a metric space, uh, but we actually have tried it on some non-metric space and it also works actually for the proximity graph, say for the inner product that's non-metric. And mm -hmm. it actually works great. And, <laughs> previous solutions and another case is we we can even uh, replace the distance function to a neural network when we do recommendations so that's in some cases can even work so it does not seem to be strictly metric mm -hmm. well can you explain you know what uh, probably contribute to this nice uh, property it is enjoying that it also works in non metric space because uh, you know when when i when, when you explain the graph search algorithm how you maintain the priority queue and so on and how you you know how you decide to uh, terminate the algorithm it looks like uh, you know at least for that example it has to be metric space uh, yes, uh, we have mm, absolutely no proof <coughs> for the non metric space, but empirically, it works very well on inner products, especially for those, say, the uh, sponsored advertisements, something like that. So we, uh, given a user vector, we want to find the best matching S vector, and the metric is inner products. Do you have an uh, explanation for that? Any, any uh, insight? I'm not so sure, but the case is since when we build a graph, uh, we just uh, consider the distance between those pairs. And when we uh, explore the graph, <coughs> it's something like when the, gra when the uh, point, data points are dense enough, then uh, whatever uh, metric you have, it is something like a coordinate descent in the uh, space. So it can somehow go to a local minimum. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we don't have other questions and let's move on to the next talk. And sorry for the noises that you have heard so far. Uh, let me see if I can play the video from my side. Um, So I can is that yeah. fine if I play the video from my side? Yeah, it's totally fine. And uh, how do I do that? I guess I need Actually, to share, you need share to screen. Down. 
uh, you yeah you need to share the screen do you have yeah. down, have you downloaded the video yes i have all the videos okay then you just need to share the screen and start the video okay so our uh, our next speaker uh, our next paper is r l r2 l s h a nearest neighbor search scheme based on two dimensional projected spaces uh, the speaker is uh, Ke Jin Lu from Hokkaido University. I apologize if my pronunciation is not correct. So let me load the video and play it. Uh, professor, I don't think anyone can hear it. I think there's. Oh, I, I apologize. I don't know why. Um, so, so, do you know why they cannot hear me? Um, you are. I, uh, I don't know. I mean, have you increased the volume of the of your player? Video. Uh, but looks like you couldn't hear anything, right? Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, my the volume on my side is fairly loud. Um, so well, it looks like uh, you you have to play the videos. Okay. I don't know why. I don't see any reason why you cannot hear it. And sorry about that. Um, okay. So could could you please start? Yeah. Hello everyone. In the following 15 minutes, I would like to introduce our new method for solving the approximate nearest neighbor search problem. Although there have been many methods proposed to solve this problem, in this paper we particularly focus on those methods using a locality sensitive caching technique, abbreviated as LSH, because LSH displays effective query performance and own strict probability guarantee in theory. Also, it can support the update on dynamic data sets very easily. 
Before introducing our method, I want to briefly review a limitation of the traditional LTC method. Here, I give an example of a state of the art LTC method called QA LTC. For simplicity, the dimension of data is assumed to be true. In the indexing phase, QALH generates two projected vectors, A1, A2, and do the query century abstracted on each vector. In the query phase, with the extension of hash brackets, QALH sends each point falling inside the hash bracket and updates its vision number, that is, its frequency of falling inside hash bracket. In this example, these red points are viewed as candidates because they are vision numbers which the compression determines beforehand. This means their exact distance distances to the query will be computed. Although QASH can return accurate results by combining multiple one-dimensional hash packets. It has to scan many force points, such as this black point in the scanning process, because this point also goes inside the hash packet at least one. This means much unnecessary IO cost is incurred in the scanning process. In order to overcome this limitation, we propose a new method called RQLSH. Different from QALSH, RQLSH generate multiple two-dimensional projected subspaces. In each subspace, RQLSH builds a query century four and only scan those points falling inside this four. Obviously, query century four can bring both points more efficiently than query century hash packet because the search region of query century four only while the search region of Expected unbounded. Here are the contributions of our work. First, similar to traditional LSH methods, our method also owns fixed probability guarantee in theory. By tuning the user specified approximation ratio, we can achieve different trade offs between the efficiency and the accuracy. Second, by replacing the traditional hash packets by theory tension force, our method can reduce the cost in scanning significantly, which will be shown in the experiment later. Next, I want to introduce how to realize this idea. This is the working flow of RPSH. The first line shows this. Uh, indexing phase and the second line shows its query phase. In the first two steps of the indexing phase, RQSH generates multiple two-dimensional projected subspaces. And each subspace is formed by two vectors generated randomly. Next, RQSH partitions each subspace into multiple rings. Here, the partition strategy is similar to that of I distance. Then all points in the same ring are indexed by a B plus tree. All B plus trees form the index structure of RQSH. In the query phase, in each subspace, RQSH use the query century four with initial radius zero by extending all four simultaneously. RQSH can find more candidates. And finally, we return to the nearest neighbor in the candidate set. In this process, two conditions play important roles. The first one is the combination condition, which determines when to terminate the expansion of force. The second one is the candidate condition, which determines which points can be viewed as candidates. Here, we also update the collision numbers of points and uh, use a similar kind of condition of QA average. Later, I will 
be more detailed on these two conditions. This is an example of the searching strategy in a single subspace. Suppose that the subspace has been partitioned into multiple rings. In this subspace, points O1 and O2 are contained in the same ring. Points O3 and O4 are contained in another three rings. For points in the same ring, we compute their reference angles to reference method B determined beforehand and treat the values of their reference angles as their keys in the corresponding D plus T. In this example, the T of O1 is 60 degree and the T of O2 is 240 degree. This determines their location in the corresponding D plus T as this video shows. Note that in this way, Every point in a single subspace is indexed only once. In the query phase, we expand the ball stepwise and use the red circle to denote the you know, the current ball. In this process, we need to ensure that all points in the ball must be scanned without missing because it is related to the correctness of our probability guarantee. Because all points are contained in rings, we need to consider the geometrical relationship between each ring and the ball. Here, there are two cases. If the ring does not intersect with the ball, we do not need to scan any point in that ring. Otherwise, we Locate the query in the corresponding B plus T. And search in two directions from the query in the lip node of the B plus T, such that the, set, the, the point in the intersection can be scanned. From this video, we can see the, the intersection covered by a section. Uh, marked in red, and uh, this section corresponds to a segment centered at the query in the lead level. So we only need to get all points in that segment, which is easy to implement. Note that some points falling outside the ball, such as point 04, may also be scanned has no effect on our probability guarantee. With regard to the update of collision numbers, we can see in the current step, point 04 has been viewed as a candidate, while the point 03 has not been scanned. But in the next step, point 03 will be scanned with the tension of the ball, and its collision number will be added by one. As discussed earlier, we need the termination condition and the candidate condition to make the searching strategy complete. Given four parameters as inputs, we can compute the threshold for the radius of the ball. If, if the radius of all balls are greater than this threshold, we terminate the extension of balls and the return result. Similarly, we can compute the on threshold four by this parameter. If the collision number of any point reaches the constant threshold four, we view it as a candidate and we compute the exact distance to the query. Such settings of threshold are related to the following results on the query performance of RPSH. In short, even User specified approximation ratio and user specified error rate. R2SH can return true results with desired success probability. 
Next, I want to explain a little more on our choice of the index structure. The reason why we choose E plus keys to index point is that uh, searching in the list node of E plus keys only includes sequential IOs, which makes the, the searching on this IO efficient. The reason why we set the dimension of subspace to two is because the index of points in the two-dimensional ring is very easy. For higher subspace dimensions, the indexing and, com and the computation of reference angles will become much more complicated, which makes the searching inefficient. Next, I want to report our experimental results. We choose two state of the art LSH methods, SI and QAR LSH as our benchmark method of LSH type. In addition, we choose a method using split feeling curve techniques called HD index as our benchmark method of non LSH type. All compared methods are disk based. We choose the following 10 real data sets with different dimensions and different sizes. These figures show the comparison results in higher cost of three LSH methods. We can see after LSH always incurs the least IO cost to achieve each target recall. Moreover, as the target recall grows, the advantage of r 2 over the other two methods becomes more obvious, which shows r 2 is the most iron efficient one. This table shows the comparison results in one time of three l methods. You can see r 2 also spends much less running time than the other two methods to achieve the target report, which is consistent with the result in the IO cost. This table shows the comparison results between each index and R2 LSH. On each million scale data set, compared with each index, R2 LSH can achieve higher recall with less roaming time. On the billion scale data set, it's one billion. Although each index runs much faster than R2 LSH, R2 LSH is still achieve higher and more, uh, still achieve a more accurate and a more stable query result than HD index. In summary, we propose, uh, we propose a new method called RTLSH. RTLSH not only owns strict probability guarantee in theory, but also shows promising results in query accuracy and stability. We believe our method is suitable for applications when priorities to this aspect. That's all. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay, so I uh, I see some questions in the chat window. So let me read it. Uh, the question is from uh, Amit Jafari. Um, so nice paper. Uh, the, the two questions are number one, what is the unit of IO cost uh, on your graphs? Number two, are you planning on releasing the source code? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, for the first re uh, for the first question, the unit of IO cost is the page of four KB. And the sec for the second reason, we are still cleaning the code and I, we will release the code on GitHub as soon as possible. Thank you. Are there more questions? Looks like not. So let's move on to the last paper. 
Uh, <clears throat> the title of the paper is Online Indices for Predictive Top K Entity and Aggregate Queries on Knowledge Graphs. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Tingjian Ge from University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Uh, Tinka actually is my student, the first. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So I see the I asterisk just, yeah. beside your name. Okay, so uh, the speaker is Yen Li from UMass Lowell. Okay, so I'll start the video. I'm Yang Okiki, student of Brown University of the Massachusetts River. Um, today, I'm going to present another paper, which is online indices for predictive top K entity and aggregate queries on knowledge graphs. Uh, here's the outline of my presentation. First, I will go, uh, to give a talk about the motivation, problem statement. Then, I will talk about the solution, evaluation, and the conclusions. First of all, let's take a look of the motivations uh, why we want to solve this problem. As you may already know, the knowledge graph is a knowledge base represented as a graph. And the knowledge graphs have seen increasingly broad applications, such as web data, user and product interactions and the ratings, and the recommender systems. In such knowledge graphs, it always is usually has the millions or billions of entities and many relation, relationships. Due to the potentially gigantic number of entities in a large knowledge graph, it would be very slow and less than desirable to process each entity on the fly and select the top ones with the highest probabilities. So let's take a look of a real example. Uh, in this picture, it shows the real uh, knowledge graph. We have entities such as Alice, Bob, Eiffel Tower, or Paris. And we are interested in the queries such as, what are the top five most likely places Bob would like to visit but has not been to yet? Also, what's the average age of all the people who visited Eiffel Tower? Due to the queries, uh, there's 2.5 million places in the world. So how can we uh, find the top five place uh, in that uh, a huge number of places. Also, there are seven million people per year who visit every tower. So, in order to fast answer those uh, queries, and uh, first of all, let's cl clarify our problem. We build a visual knowledge graph, which is based on the no uh, real knowledge graph, as in this. Uh, picture uh, as an example. And uh, we have different uh, vertex types including users, such as any Bob restaurant, uh, garage store, gra grocery stories, and styles of food. The graph also has different uh, relationship types in edges, uh, which, uh, which are illust illustrated with different colors, such as read high frequency and belongs to a style of food. This knowledge graph is incomplete. For example, it misses the information that Amy likes restaurant two with a certain probability, and she likes a restaurant three with a, a certain probability, which are illustrated as a red dashed edge in the picture. To, so for, uh, to formalize uh, the visual knowledge graph, uh, it has the same set of vertices as knowledge graph G, but has edges where each edge is of the form HRTP. Uh, the HRT is a triple, and uh, the P is extended with a probability P determined by algorithm A, uh, where the algorithm A can be uh, analyzers, which can do the link prediction on knowledge graph. So after we have the uh, visual knowledge graph, we are interested in the two type of queries. The first one is top K query, which given high entity H and the relationship R, we return the top K entity T with the highest probabilities. Uh, in our example is, what are the top five most likely restaurants Amy would rate high but has not been to yet? And the another type of query is the aggregate query, 
which returns the expected aggregate value, such as count, sum, average, max, or mean, as in SQL of the attributes of entity P. In our example, is what's the average edge of all the people who would like restaurant to? So after we clarify our problem, here's our solution. We embedding vectors transformation and uh, build the cracking and uneven indices for visual knowledge graphs. Then we uh, devise algorithm to answer those two type of queries. First of all, let's take a look of the embedding vectors transformation. Since our method is based on knowledge graph embedding, so here's the example of uh, how does knowledge graph embedding works. Knowledge graph embedding is such that we have the knowledge graph and after we do the uh, embedding in the embedding space, uh, the node and the relationship link to each other is close to each other in that space. And for the method that we are using in our paper is a translational model, such as trans E or trans A. The translational model, which is in, uh, by embedding, after embedding, the, as in this example, the Obama, is the hand entity and the was born as the relationship and uh, the hand entity of Obama plus the was born in the relationship is approximately equal to the Honolulu. And uh, after we done the knowledge graph embedding, we will get the embedding vectors of each node and the relationship type. So after we have those uh, embedding vectors, which usually has tens or hundreds of dimensions, and we convert the embedding vectors uh, into a lower dimension, uh, for example, three, using by apply the Johnson Industrial transform. We also prove that for two points U and V in the embedding space S1, that are of uh, Euclidean distance L1, their Euclidean distance L2 in space S2 is preserved with a probabilistic upper bound and the uh, probabilistic lower bound. Now let's take a look, how do we build index on those embedding vectors? First of all, we are thinking that can we use an off-the-shelf special index such as an R3? Actually, we can, but it's too wasteful. Instead of build such an R3, we build a cracking and uneven R3 index online upon the arrival of sequence of queries which perform on-demand top-down backlog of R3 upon all queries right in the region Q. So first, let's take a look of the R3 backlog algorithm. Um, it solves a set of right angle objects D into a few sort of orders, D1, D2, so Ds, and then perform a greedy top-down construction on the R3. And each time, we perform a binary split at a node based on one of the sort of orders and a causal model. We observe that building such an index is still very time and, and space consuming, and the search space is very uneven given the space of queries. So instead of building buckler R tree, we build our index. We only grow the partitions of nodes that contain the data points in core region Q. And moreover, we do not need to break a partition if it contains data points all in Q. And then the stop condition of a binary partition of one element E in the current control is either E is irrelevant to Q or almost all data points in E are in Q. So as a result, regions in the embedding space as two that are more relevant to queries are indexed in finer granularities while the irrelevant regions stay at a high level of the tree. To compare R3 bulk loading algorithm with ours, uh, first of all, the R3 bulk loading uh, index rectangle objects and all nodes are fully partitioned, resulting in a balanced R3. And the cost function penalized the MBR overland due to the split. Well, ours, uh, we are indexed data points, uh, for example, the entities. And we only grow the partitions of a node that contain the data points in core region Q. And then we extend the cost model into a two uh, company that cost CQ and the CO. Let's take a look of our cost model. 
So here's our node splitting cost model, uh, where CQ is the cost estimated for accessing core region Q. In our example, is the minimal number of leaf pages to accommodate all the data points in Q. And the CO is the cost incurred by overlaps between partitions. We increment CO by this formation at each binary split, uh, split where O is the uh, overlap region between two resulting partitions L and H over the binary split. And H is the height of the R tree where the split happens. And the beta is larger or equal to one. It's uh, constantly indicating that uh, overlap higher in the R tree has more impact and is more costly. Moreover, we can afford a more split choice. Instead of selecting one split with optimal cost, we get the top key best space. We create a priority queue of active controls based on their cost, and the complete definition space for the currently Korean and determine the best plan based on its dusty or aggressive only. This will result in a good global index tree. And after we build the index, uh, now we are talking about algorithm to answer queries. The first query is top key query. We iteratively reduce the query rectangular region until key data points nearest to H plus R. So corresponding vector are identified. We also prove that the algorithm accuracy and performance are guaranteed. The details will be in the table. The, another query is the aggregate and static queries. We find relevant evidence within a ball, which means a probability threshold. And the closest data points have the prob probability one. If there are too many such data points, we use sampling. And then we can handle all SQL uh, aggregate queries, such as count, sum, average, max, and mean. For example, the expectation of a sum query result is this formulation where A is the sample and the PI, which is the probability regarding each uh, sample of data point. And the VI is the attribute values we want to sum up. And uh, we also prove that the ground truth sum uh, query result is within a probabilistic bound of the result written by our algorithm. And also details in the paper using uh, magnetic algorithm and Azuma inequality. Next, let's take a look of our evaluation. We use uh, three type of uh, data, three real world uh, knowledge graph data size. The first is uh, Freebase and Movie and Amazon. Freebase is a large collaborative knowledge base and online collection of structured data harvested from many sources. Google's knowledge graph was powered in part by Freebase. The movie dataset describes five-star rating and a free text tagging activity from movie lens. Amazon contains product view, reviews and the metadata from Amazon. And the, the uh, statistics of the datasets are summarized in this table. And we also using four baselines to compare with ours. Uh, the first is uh, no index at all. And the second one is PH pH tree, which is a high dimensional index. And then we compare with the bulk of the R tree without our clock index tens. And then we compare with the H2 ERSH, which is a lo locality sensitive hashing mechanism to find the nearest neighbor in a space. Let's take a look of the result. First, let's take a look of the uh, result on previous data set. We examine the execution times of a no index PH tree and the bulk load R tree index. For this data set, we cannot use the H2 ARSH schema because it can only work with one relationship. As you can from the picture, our result is three orders of magnitude faster with our index compared to no index. And now only uh, PH tree and uh, bulk loading have an offline index building time. In this uh, picture is the precision K. At K is the precision of the top K result tables using our index compared to the top K tables under the no index method. Also same shows on the movie data side. Same results shows on the Amazon data side. 
our core reprocessing time is one order of magnitude faster than H2 ARSH for the movie dataset and two orders of magnitude faster for the unknown dataset. And in all, the experiments show that our cracking indexes will be effective in accomplishing our goal for answering two types of important queries of vocational knowledge graphs, top K entity uh, queries and aggregate queries. So to conclude my presentation, uh, we transform the embedding vectors to a lower dimension space for indexing and prove a tight bound on the accuracy guarantees. We build cracking and uneven archery indices for visual knowledge graph. Then we devise the query processing algorithm for top K and aggregate queries with a novel proof of accuracy. As future work, we would like to consider dynamic knowledge graph updates. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there uh, questions? Okay, uh, looks like uh, we don't have any question yet. Maybe uh, let me ask one question. Uh, I noticed in one of the slides where you summarize uh, the characteristics of the three data sets. Uh, Freebase, of, of course, is quite different from the other two data sets uh, in that Freebase has 2,000 uh, different relationships, but Amazon and uh, which one is the other one? The other, you know, they only have four different relationships, um, but looks like uh, the, the approach, uh, the index works uh, equally well on all of them. Um, could you comment on this? Uh, let's see. I think the number we present uh, is, uh, yeah, we separate for uh, different data sets. Um, so why do you think it's related to uh, the number of relationship types? Because the, mostly the index is index entities, the embedding of entities. So, um, when you make the prediction, uh, when you make the query, it's about a specific relationship type. Mm -hmm. So uh, the number of relationship types, I don't think has a particular impact on, on um, the index itself. We don't, we don't index the relationship. Okay. Yeah. Are there uh, other questions? Looks like uh, we don't have more questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, and thanks for attending this session. So uh, I think we are done here. Um, I can't share, is there anything that I need to do? Um, not really. I think okay. it's over, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Rafa. Yeah. Bye.